Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Amanda Shi. I'm an anesthesiologist and intensivist. And today I wanna to talk about everything related to the American Board of Anesthesiology Applied Exam, also known as the Oral Boards. For those of you that have been following along, you may have already watched my previous video about how I was planning or preparing to study for this exam, but now I have actually taken it. So in April, I took the Zoom version of the applied exam and recently got my notification that I had passed and got my certification in the mail as well. A lot of people have asked about how I ended up really studying. I mean, I came up with all of these plans for how I would study, but at the end of the day, we all know that studying frequently does not go as planned. I can say that for every single one of my board exams, I have come up with a study plan, and in reality, I never actually get to all the things that I hope to get to. So in this video, I'm gonna go over a couple of things. One, I'm gonna go over what I actually did and was able to accomplish for preparing for this exam. Uh, I'm going to go over my exam experience with you guys. Again, this was over Zoom. So those of you guys that are going to be taking your exam in 2022 and beyond, it's possible that some of the things that I talk about are not applicable to your exam. And then I'm also gonna talk about some tips that I have for your success or some personal ideas that I thought I would share uh, going through the experience that I hope will help you. So let's dive into the preparation part. In my previous blog entry and in my video, I talk about how I'm using ultimate board prep. That is the main crux of my studying is using ultimate board prep cases. And what I did with them was exactly what I kind of outlined uh, prior was that I would take in a stem, one of the stems, I would read through it. I go through the outline of how I would think about each organ system and anticipate different issues that would arise based on that organ system. That way of organizing your thoughts is in the YouTube video that I had shared prior and it's available here as well. Basically, I would look at a stem, I would outline it out in my iPad on OneNote, and then afterwards I would start going through the questions and writing out some of the answers to those questions. Um, I'd answer them in my head first, but then I'd write out some of the answers that are given in the answer key. This for me is what I needed in order to actually synthesize, memorize, and try to actively learn the material because I can't just read the material and, and memorize it. I don't have a photographic memory, so I have to write things in order to remember them. And one of the things that I also did too is there's various scores or other types of information that you need to memorize. For example, uh, the Glasgow coma score or the different types of tracheoesophageal fistulas. These are things that I do not do on a daily basis in my head. And so I actually use like a blank OneNote page in order to write them out again um, as a way to memorize and practice the material and trying to integrate it as a, something that I can easily uh, come up with when I needed the information. One of the challenges that definitely I faced while I was trying to study was that I was still working full-time clinically and I found that it obviously took a very long time to go through each case and be able to write out the answers for each of these cases. So what I found was in the months leading to the exam, I still had a lot of cases to get through. And that kind of pushed me to move a little faster. So I started to prioritize making sure I was exposed to the cases, exposed to the types of questions, exposed to the material, but I didn't spend as much time writing every single thing out. I definitely took the time on subjects that I thought I was struggling with or areas that I was not as familiar with anymore. So things that were related to pediatrics and obstetrics, I took a little extra time there to really try to relearn, memorize uh, important things, important clinical ways of approaching things. And then afterwards, if it was something else that I was more familiar with, it was like a general surgery case, something that I see in the ICU, those are things I didn't prioritize because that's what I see in my day-to-day -day work. 
So at the end of the day, for ultimate board prep, my recommendation is that you get through all of the cases there. I think it's really important. Some people have also asked about whether I went through old ABA STEM. So most residency programs or some of your senior colleagues uh, have access to old, like real old ABA case STEMs so that you can get a feel for the exact uh, type of case STEM, like the length of it. Because I will say the real ABA stems tend to be very, very long, sometimes even longer than the UBP long stems. Uh, and you know, the format of the questions can be very different, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually never used any of the old ABA case stems because I felt like I needed answers to each of the questions. And a lot of those stems don't have like an answer key readily available. So if there was someone that had created an answer key for that, and I felt like I trusted that material, then Yes, I would have used that, but I felt that UBP was enough for me to be able to get a broad exposure to the types of cases that I needed and or may encounter during the exam. So I just focused on that resource. I would also say very similar to my prior board exams, the most important thing for you guys is to pick a resource and actually stick with it and finish it. So don't go jumping around to a bunch of different places. You need to make sure you have finish the resource in order to really get the most out of it. The other things that I've used is actually the American Board of Anesthesiology's website. The website has so much material that is useful to you. There are a lot of pages of material that you should definitely read through. Uh, I have all the links to the different outlines and the different components that are really helpful from the ABA website. But I will say for studying for the OSCE component of the exam, everything you need is on the ABA website to study for that. I personally did not use any external resources whatsoever to study for the OSCE because everything was there that I needed uh, on the website. So definitely pay attention to those materials and the links that I provided here. As an extension of that, in terms of OSCE things, I also used this paper uh, that was referenced in the ABA website's materials about the TE views that would be examined or that would be asked about on the exam. So I went ahead and got that paper and I made Anki flashcards of the different views in order to make myself very comfortable with those views. So for those of you that do not use Anki flashcards, the way they look is this is just the computer program version of it. If you buy the phone app version, it costs money, but if you are just gonna use it on the computer, I just went ahead and created these flashcards that have each of the views and have the answer. So you can just go through them um, and it'll automatically flip it from the image to the text or the text first to the image. So this was an easy way for me to refamiliarize myself with the TE views. That's not something I do on a daily basis in my practice because I'm not cardiac anesthesia. Um, and it's been a while since I've done cardiac anesthesia. So this was one way that I was able to study the TE views. I've shared all of the screenshots from that paper as well as uh, an exported Anki uh, deck file in the blog post and in the description below. So if you wanted to use those resources, feel free to use them uh, so you can get familiar with the TE views again. The other resource I used was the Rapid Review Anesthesiology Oral Boards. So that is this book. And what I liked about this book was that first and foremost, you cannot use this book as your primary resource for studying. It is not adequate for that. But I really like things that feel really fast to review. And this definitely provided some really basic cases and really basic concepts that I could read a case through before bed and feel like I was at least reviewing something high yield and in a more efficient manner. Like I said, this is not a good primary resource, but I felt like this was a nice supplement for my UVP work. And if I just wanted something really quick to review, uh, I went to this. And so 
I, I read through this maybe a month or two in advance and I felt like it was a nice way to just make sure to be exposed to things again, to highlight certain things that I needed to review. Uh, and I just thought it was a really easy to read resource as well. So I did use this book. And then the other book that I had talked about in my original entry and my original video was Yao's Anesthesiology, Problem-Based uh, Management, Problem-Oriented Patient Management. And what I'll say is that this is an excellent resource, but it is way too much for your oral boards. If you are a very fast reader, or if you feel like you want to reference a chapter for a specific topic that you are reviewing for your oral boards, this is definitely great for that. So really being able to delve a little deeper into a specific topic that you haven't encountered or you've forgotten a lot about, this is a great resource for that. And I find that this was a great reference for some of the things that I hadn't seen in a while or that I really wanted to dive a little deeper so that I was able to articulate medical management appropriately. So that's why I would use this book. I think it's a great book for just in general, for general practice. Now that I'm in attending, I feel like it has a lot of really relevant cases and really relevant ways of presenting it. So this is a nice resource for you kind of longer term, but not necessarily in the short term for your oral boards. To move on to the exam experience, component. What I'll say is that the Zoom oral board examination went very smoothly for me. Uh, the ABA had worked really, really hard to make sure that all of your questions are answered, that they really set you up for success for the day of. And so as a result, what you'll find is that you'll get your date a few months uh, ahead of time. You already know your week ahead of time, but your actual date and your times will be sent out a couple months ahead of time. Uh, I bookmarked that email and uh, made sure that I had access to that. Uh, anytime I was curious about it, I put it on my calendar just to make sure I knew exactly when it was. And then after that, in the couple weeks leading up to the exam, the ABA does a live webinar where they put all the questions, the most commonly asked questions. They kind of walk you through exactly the setup that you're going to encounter on your exam day. They talk about uh, what it's going to look like, the, the whole setup. They talk about things like suspicious activity and how that could potentially terminate your exam. And that's one of the things that I would say is a little different between the Zoom exam and real life is that in real life, someone who's sitting in front of you can tell if you're cheating, but on Zoom, you know, doing some shifty eyes or looking very, very cautiously into the distance may not be a good idea for the Zoom exam because someone may be concerned that you're actually looking at a reference behind the camera or maybe looking at someone behind the camera in order to have them answer the question for you that you'll read off. So I don't think that that is something that happens very frequently, but I want you guys to be aware that that's something they'll be looking for, a suspicious activity. In terms of the nitty gritty of the actual exam day, so I had my OSCE first thing in the morning, so I got up early, got ready, hopped onto my computer, and I'll show you my Zoom setup later in the video, but I hopped onto my computer, logged into the website, and uh, kind of waited for things to get started. So once you log in, you get put into kind of a waiting room until everything is ready. The OSCE portion is seven different stations at eight minutes a piece with four minute breaks in between so that you can review the case or the scenario that's there and prepare to answer questions. So the OSCE portion, uh, it's really like you go in into a room and then the different people will come in and out of the room. So you just sit there and as you have a scenario, it shows up on a browser separately and you go ahead and answer within that eight minute period. Of the seven different stations. One of them will be a TEE station with cases and the other one will be a monitor station with cases. The other five will be some sort of interaction with a standardized patient, something very similar to the OSCEs you had in medical school. So again, what I will say is that the OSCE portion, you can 100% prepare for using the materials on the ABA website. 
I cannot speak to blocks, TTE, lung ultrasound, because I did not get examined on that in my 2021 examination. However, the website materials definitely go over everything you probably will need to know in order to succeed in those stations on the OSCE as well. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you spend serious time looking at that material. Once my OSCE portion was done, my OSCE was actually at like 7.30 in the morning and then my SOE portion was in the afternoon at like two or something PM. I found that first of all, it is exhausting to go through seven stations where you're constantly talking. So I found that I decided to take a nap. So one of the nice things about the Zoom oral boards is that once I was done with the first part, I went into my own bed, took a nap and then woke up, had a nice lunch, got a shot of espresso and got ready to get going for the SOE portion. For both portions too, they say it's okay to have a glass of water there. So I definitely had a glass of water ready. For the SOE portion, generally it was, it's normally 35 minutes when you're at the testing center, but for Zoom tech, technological difficulties and sometimes you get some lag on the video conferencing, they actually extended the time that you're in your SOE session to 40 minutes instead of 35. And so that's one little difference between Zoom and real life. For the SOE portion, you get put in a waiting room and then you get a case, you get 20 minutes, uh, to review that long stem, you go into the room with your examiners. You have two examiners there. They ask you the questions about the case, uh, both. And the pattern, again, for you guys, just so you're aware, is long stem is always going to be intra-op and post-op, and short stem is always going to be pre-op and intra-op. Long stem comes first, short stem comes later. Long stem, you get 20 minutes to prepare with it. Uh, short stem, you get 10 minutes to prepare with it. And then after both stems, you'll have up to three grad bag questions, which again, all of this information is on the website, which is why I'm sharing it with you pretty openly. So you get into a room, you get asked all these questions by the two examiners, and once you're done, you're done and you say thank you and move on to the next. So I wanted to transition now into a couple of practical tips. Again, these are my opinions. These are some thoughts that I had to try to help you prepare and succeed on this exam. First and foremost, I think the most important thing to do to prepare for this exam is to review as many cases as you can. And again, like I said earlier, I felt like it was really important to review cases where I had the answers to them because I wanted to be able to learn the medical knowledge component. I think that's where I was most concerned. I was less concerned about answering the question that was posed to me. I feel pretty comfortable in my ability to do that. And I, I did feel comfortable with that. Just having had experiences with prior uh, practice or board exams, I generally can come up with the response that I want and explain my clinical rationale and reasoning pretty easily. But in terms of actually having the medical knowledge and remembering that stuff from medical school, that was where I really needed to focus my attention. So that's how I use the cases that I studied. Uh, I'd say that the next kind of piece of advice I have is really that you really need to do an honest self-assessment of your strengths. So if your strengths are in the ability to articulate your clinical rationale, reasoning, problem solving, kind of going through all of that, out loud, then you may focus more on the medical knowledge stuff, reviewing some of the things that you haven't been exposed to very recently. That may be more of your focus rather than the actual speaking part. There are some people that will need some more time or need practice actually doing the speaking part. And that's the that's where I think it's really important that you work with an oral board examiner so you can get very specific tips as to how you can improve that other things that you can do in order to stay calm, collected, and be able to actually answer the questions uh, so that you can succeed on this exam. Another kind of piece of advice I have is really figuring out how to answer the question. So there's all these things going around about how, you know, well, say is UBP has these really, really, really long responses. And in reality, you're not gonna have that much time to go over every little thing to say, I would put on the standard ASA monitors, those five monitors are like going through all of that and saying, I would do a physical exam, checking the JVD, checking the uh, lower extremity edema, uh, listening for an S4. It, a lot of that stuff, you probably won't have enough time to say all of. So 
generally a succinct answer, but making sure that you actually answer the question at hand rather than going in a big, long tangent circle, whatever, just trying to include this other fluffy stuff. The end of the day, the fluffy stuff may come into play. You may want to say, I would perform a physical exam looking for signs of heart failure. I would perform a bedside TTE to assess the patient's gross biventricular function. You can say things like that without having to go into obnoxious detail over it. And thus, potentially wasting some time if you do that. So really balancing how you're gonna answer these questions I think is important. Again, like I said, the UVP responses are too long. So that's a good way to just calibrate your answers as you practice. Another thing that I had learned when I was going through this process is that it's okay to say, I don't know, or to say that you're going to have to look up a reference in order to determine that course of treatment and then move on to the next question. You shouldn't do that for every question because then you really aren't answering anything, but every once in a while you're gonna get a really esoteric topic or question or something, it seems like it came out of left field. And during those questions, it's okay to just move on from them so that you can potentially encounter a question that you do know for sure and get the points that you need for that. So one of the challenges I think people have is they wanna answer every question correctly, but if they don't know the answer to it and they are wasting their time on it, they may end up losing out on questions that they know for sure afterwards. Other things too that I personally did, so during the review time prior to your cases and the SOE, you have a lot of time to review. That's like way too much time in order to sketch out each of the organ systems, anticipate each of the questions that'll come with each of the organ systems. So during the first time when I was going over the case, I actually wrote out a lot of references just to refresh my memory about those things. So certain things like reviewing the uh, Glasgow coma score again, or the tracheoesophageal fistula types. I just like drew stuff out just to make sure to kind of get the brain juices flowing and being ready to answer things like that. So I just used that time to write stuff out that I wanted to remind myself that in the instance that I suddenly forgot something and needed to refresh myself, it was right in front of me and I had just reviewed it in my mind. It was kind of brought to my forefront of my mind. So that's something I personally did because there's just so much time and I felt like it was wasted time to just sit there and wait. In terms of just two other specific, so one specific thing about the OSCE, I cannot emphasize enough that the OSCE can be studied for just using materials on the website. Unless again, you haven't had that experience in the past with OSCEs in medical school and standardized patients and being able to review that material and be able to respond to it in an empathetic or appropriate, compassionate way, then that's something that I think you definitely have to practice and make sure that you get feedback about the way you present yourself, about the way that you ask questions and build rapport, et cetera, et cetera. If those standardized patients and OSCEs in medical school were things that were pretty straightforward for you, I do feel comfortable saying that just going through the materials on the website in terms of the different kinds of scenarios that you will encounter, the ABA really does give you all of the information you need in order to prepare for the OSCE on the website. So make sure you read through all of those materials very closely. The other really big thing I wanna highlight about the OSCE is that I didn't find the little links to sample videos for the monitor station, the TE station until quite late. And I wish someone had pointed those out to me earlier because those were vital in getting really comfortable with knowing how a case scenario is gonna be presented, types of questions I'm gonna be asked in those two particular stations, as well as getting a feel for how long the time that is allotted really is. So like the first TE one, it's like a 45 second thing, and 45 seconds is actually a very short amount of time when you're trying to analyze a video and you haven't seen it in a long time and you just have to answer a question outright. So. It's incredible how time feels so different when you see how it's laid out. So definitely, definitely, definitely look at those videos, review them, get comfortable with them so you will not be surprised on the day of your exam. 
I use, like I said, the Anki flashcards for TE, so check those out if that's something you wanna do, or use the files that I provided in order to make your own flashcards on another app or something like that. And finally, just the Zoom stuff. All I'll say with that is that everything went really smoothly from a Zoom perspective. My setup is such that I did have a second monitor where you're not supposed to use it so i got rid of it i actually just unplugged it from my computer altogether um, i optimized my viewing so i went ahead and put books under my laptop like i usually have um, and the other thing too i just am remembering now is that you actually should dress up as if you were going to the oral or going to the boards in real life so something i did note is that you know, there were, you sit in a waiting room with other candidates and not all candidates actually came in like a suit. I personally would never want to risk my exam based on my attire and my professionalism in terms of that. And it's so easy to just wear a suit and wear like stretchy sort of black pants down below in order to take this exam. So you're already in the comfort of an area you probably already know and you get that advantage in a way. And so I feel like the least you can do is make sure to show up in business attire, meaning an actual suit, uh, to the exam so that you don't get disqualified or lose points for something so small like that. Other than that, I my Zoom station is essentially a white wall behind me. Uh, I make sure to, like I said, prop it so that I look like I, my viewing is most optimized and it's not from below or way above. Um, optimize some lighting just so that my examiners can see me. And then practicing also looking into the camera when answering questions so it looks like you're actually looking at the examiners as well. So I think that is everything that I have to share about the oral board experience I had, about some of the tips and things that I did to prepare. If you found this video helpful, please, please, please let me know in the comments. Let me know if you have any specific questions for me. Feel free to email me, reach out to me on my different channels, and I will see you guys next time.